Thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate the introduction, uh, however uh, forced it was. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to have a look around first before I start my presentation. Um, I don't think there is a hockey player in this room that does not believe deep down that they could score on Grant Fuhrer low blocky. <laughs> just say it. <laughs> One of the things I want to talk about in this uh, presentation is a little bit about where we are and where the future lies. Because uh, one of the, the speakers of this conference really have done, done an outstanding job in really talking about you know, the challenges we have in front of us. And uh, what some of us find, because Dr. Tatter, uh, Dr. Cantu, uh, uh, John, We've all been here a long time, and you, you have been here a long time, 11 years, some of you. And you remember when we first started, we were just trying to convince people that hitting the head is a bad thing and creates a lot of bad problems. We knew that, and you knew that intuitively, but we really had to understand it more thoroughly. Fortunately, in the past 10, 15 years, there's been a great deal of research, as you've seen here at this conference, and it's really starting to help us understand the mechanisms. So what we felt intuitively, and in some cases knew, really is starting to become uh, evident from a scientific perspective. Now, beating people over the head with science gets you absolutely nowhere. And so really understanding uh, this, because it has to be true, can't be something we're making up. It has to be true. So we have to have science that does that. However, we also need a way to make it better. So what I want to talk about is really a little bit of where we're going to go in the future and why. Um, first, I'd like to thank you as participants. As you know, every speaker comes up here and connects with you as participants. We see you as colleagues in this conference and as important as anybody that shows up. And you can feel that in this conference. And I, I got to admit, I'd like to recognize the organizers of the conference uh, because they've done that as uh, my brother has been involved in this to make this really student and athlete centered. And that's important to us because that's why we're here. Okay. Can you, oh, here we go. Uh, for disclosures, I've had another, hold a number of grants and involvement with a number of organizations that help uh, grant and support our, our lab in terms of research. Uh, I'd like to start with just a little bit of summary. I think, if anything, we understand that brain injuries in youth are life-changing, and, and, and they are. Uh, fortunately, a lot of them aren't, but unfortunately, a lot of them are. And it's important for us to know this because it really keeps our, maintains our commitment to make it better. Uh, we're gonna focus a little bit on youth sports because the vast majority of athletes are youth. The vast majority. And as um, uh, the presentations here have identified, Julie especially, that the children are at risk for very physiological reasons, not just because they're children, but because their brains are developing. And so they're at higher risk, we need to protect them, and it can't be just stop playing exercise, it's gotta be how do we protect them effectively. So I want to warn you, this uh, next slide I'm going to show you, it's a video, it's a, a, a human being, and um, it's a, a research we're undertaking in our lab. Uh, it's post-mortem research, but it's really important because it really shows two things. And I'm gonna play it a couple, I have to ask the, the technicians to play it a couple of times because I think I only get one chance at it. But what you can see, uh, I don't know, this way, here we go. I want you to look at two things. One is really at the base of the skull and the other behind the skull. Can you rerun this uh, video, please? And you can see how, how much the brain moves in the skull. This is only a four meter per second impact. That's not an extremely hard impact. Uh, one more time, if you don't mind. The other place I want you to look is right down here at the base of the skull. So what you can see 
is that the brain moves quite a bit in the skull, and it moves around the brain stem. So what we find when we look at this research, we actually measure all the strain in the brain tissue. What we find is there's large strains around the brain stem, and this is consistent with what uh, Dr. Letty and Dr. Cantu are really describing in terms of not just symptoms, but where the damage in the brain is occurring. Um, there was one other thing that we did here that we're quite proud of is that typically when we do modeling of the brain and the stuff I've presented and Warren tells me don't bring here anymore, is the accelerations of the brain from the skull. And so what we do is we look at the acceleration of the skull around the brain, and from that we can then um, uh, predict the amount of strain the brain would uh, incur, as well as the different parts of the brain that are being damaged. Uh, what we found in this research, which was fascinating for us, is that there is energy upon impact that goes directly to the ventricles, which are, have fluid in them, that then distorts the ventricles that creates strain around the ventricles. And we have two neurosurgeons involved in this, uh, three actually neurosurgeons involved in this study, and they brought it up first. When we were starting to look at, this is high-speed video, or x-ray, sorry, about 7,500 uh, frames a second. And they were looking at, they're going, you know what we notice is when some of our patients um, come in and we have to do surgery, or we look at the MRI, sorry, and uh, we notice that there's some small bleeds around the ventricles. And what we're seeing in this, this uh, video is that the distortion of the ventricles. So they said, that seems to be consistent with what we see in the OR. And so we immediately, our engineers immediately took the opportunity to start looking at measuring strain around the ventricles. And lo and behold, we saw there's another energy pulse that goes into the brain, not before actually, the skull accelerates. So this mechanism is really telling us how different parts of the brain are coming under strain and being damaged and then exhibiting symptoms. So it's really helping us understand a little bit more of the puzzle. Um, did I jump over? I don't think so. Okay, so here, and this I do not need to spend a lot of time on. Um, there are a lot of symptoms in concussion. They're inconsistent, um, and they really are wide-ranging, so they have a lot of effect. So you can see here the physical issues, cognitive issues, emotional issues, and sleep symptoms. And they all can be present, a lot can be present, or very few can be present as uh, um, as Jenny uh, discussed, uh, in some cases none are present, but you're still damaging the neurons. And the other thing that I think um, uh, I just want to reinforce, because this has been covered, but it really does matter. Because children who are struggling, and it's hard to determine a lot of times because of the wide-ranging symptoms, that exactly how this is affecting them how it's affecting these kids. And it really does matter because it has serious consequences. And I know from discussing this here at this conference that children who fail a grade are at a high risk of dropping out of school. And that, at this age, is very, very important. And some, as a lot of the practitioners who have presented here, these kids are in stress or under, under constraints for a year in some cases. So they struggle. So their mental health affects their education and their future. We know that, it's been reinforced here, and it's important. So in, in this slide, we forget there's 100, around 100 billion neurons with trillions of interactions. So trying to really understand this in context of uh, how it affects your life is extraordinarily complex. So you'll probably notice here in the top right-hand corner, uh, Warren is holding a fish I had just caught and let him, I said, go ahead, hold the, the, the fish and I'll take a picture for you. And, uh, and the other one is the person in the middle is his granddaughter have, enjoying a hot dog. Uh, but what this tells us is the brain is the human experience. And whether you're uh, at school, uh, really struggling, or whether you're at 60 years old trying to remember how to go to the store and get a, a quart of milk, it affects your performance. And so these things matter in light of the fact that it's going to have an effect on your life at all levels of your life.
think the bat there we go. I think the battery may be wearing out on this. And so the other piece is when uh, Dr. Cantu so elegantly talked about chronic traumatic encephalopathy, I always looked at it differently. I always said, yes, the smoking gun to connect, especially sport trauma and uh, disease, neurodegenerative disease, was chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And the work that the team is doing at Boston University is just outstanding. However, uh, as uh, Dr. Stam uh, mentioned that we are really, when you're damaging neurons from trauma, physical trauma, it affects all aspects. So whether it manifests the CTE or other types of either early onset dementia, early onset Parkinson's, or all kinds of problems with brain function, doesn't matter. It still affects your life. And sure, CT is important because it's one of the diseases that really c connects the dots. Um, and so that's why you see it in the, uh, in the media a great deal. But certainly these other diseases can be, and Lou Gehrig's disease as well, can be just as devastating um, and uh, are a res response to a decreased function of the neural system due to trauma. Uh, and the other thing I think all of us up here, we, as you know, pretty everybody here, uh, the speakers as well, has participated in sports. We have nothing but the, the utmost respect for what sports and activity brings to a child's life, to an adult's life. And so things like socialization, mental well-being, improved physical fitness, improved physical health, uh, supports healthy decisions, improves self-worth, uh, engages students to education. Um, uh, Senator Ke Keon uh, was doing a presentation. He's a famous neurocardiologist uh, in, um, in Ottawa and uh, did tremendous research and had been recognized for his research. Uh, in one of his presentations, he said, as he was getting more senior in his uh, career, he said, if only I had known that what the power of physical exercise, he said, I would have spent more time on uh, using physical exercise as a treatment than the drugs that I was helping develop. And uh, to me, that was very telling because this is a man who spent his lifetime and very successfully. And he understood the power of physical education, of physical activity and the importance of it in people's lives. And this was specific to cardiac health. I, okay, here we go. In youth sports, for a big part of it, we are asking the children to make a decision about their risk, to report when they're injured. And this is problematic because there, there's a lot of reasons why this doesn't work. One, first of all, if you've concussed, you're confused whether you're a child or an adult. Secondly, children are not, I mean, we can educate them and it's important to educate them, but they really are not the best, most knowledgeable people in terms of health to make these decisions. So, and the third one is children do not want to stop playing. Um, as uh, Grant Fury uh, described, you know, they, they, they do not want to come off the ice, they do not want to come off the field. So now we're telling them, make a decision about your health and your risk and your future. Is that a good idea? But that's what we're doing. Even Mike Webster, who was the first, for those of you who don't know, the, he was the first um, athlete that was uh, diagnosed upon death, of course, with CTE uh, in modern day and really started this discussion and this issue around how trauma affected the neurodegenerative disease in chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And even he, as a professional football player for uh, Pittsburgh, I believe, uh, said, I, I just thought it was a game that we had helmets that protected us and we could go out there and bash each other in the head. You know, that was his understanding of the game. And so we're asking children to make the very same uh, decisions. So one of the things you've heard us talk a lot about in these last few years, in last years, is that we've really looked at professional sports, the NS NHL, the NFL, et cetera, trying to get them to change the game because they had the most power, the most influence. Um, but quite frankly, they have a different objective. And it's not a criticism, it's a reality. That, mm -hmm. oh, here we go. And that really, the goal of these organizations are profit. And it's, 
like I say, I'm not trying to suggest that that's a, a bad thing. It's just that they have uh, a competing um, interest. And it makes it extremely tough to work in this space. Um, and they, so who has the control of that? Well, quite frankly, at the end of the day, it's the team owners. They're the ones that really control, determine who your commissioner is and how those decisions come down. Um, who should have control? Uh, in this case, it should be the athletes because they're adults, they're professionals, they're negotiating, so they need to be in charge of their health. This is gradually shifting, but today still uh, most of those um, athletes, especially the ones that are trying to make teams, have to defer to the teams to make their healthcare decisions. So what's really important to us is in youth sport. And youth sport is kind of ended up on the shoulders of the sport organizations. Sport organizations are trying to set standards, and they are, as uh, Dr. Uh, Cornway has uh, described, that they are, <laughs> she's always wondering if I can actually pronounce that properly. Um, however, they are doing a lot better. There's no questions, question about it. What we want to do and look, we think in the future is to provide better information to these organizations so people like the parents, like the coaches, um, really have the right information to make the right decisions. So what we've done in, in, uh, in these past eight year or eight conferences here is really focus on prevention, diagnosis and treatment. Because we think this is really the core of how we're going to uh, improve um, the management of concussion uh, and hopefully the prevention. This seems to be running out of battery juice. Here we go. In prevention, the focus has been improving coaching education programs, athlete and parent education programs, medical staff training, improved uh, equipment, specifically helmets, uh, rule changes to manage head trauma risk and dosage, uh, no-hit practices, um, hit-to-the-head penalties, uh, identifying and managing special populations who are higher risk for complications. Uh, and it, it's interesting because we always are leaning forward as uh, scientists and want to do better. But when we look at where we came, there has been a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, progress in these areas. So we have to recognize that. Um, again, in diagnosis, better education, defining what a concussion is. It's a complex uh, injury, and nobody's going to deny that, but we're getting much better at it, and being conservative is really uh, the key, and understanding that. And that never existed when we started this journey. Improved testing tools and diagnose, diagnosing concussions, uh, helmet mouth, mouth sensors to monitor impacts, improved surveillance programs, as you know, the NHL and NFL use spotters uh, to help uh, identify risk. Uh, and treatment, the urgency of removing concussed athletes from play, that's really become uh, understood. Um, more effective, it's not easy, as, as Dr. Cornier pointed out, it's not easy to, to employ because you've got parents and coaches who like to keep their star athlete on the field. Um, more effective treatments of symptoms, rest, and so forth. Uh, concussion ma management programs, improved treatment programs. Um, it's also for special populations, uh, safe return to play. Uh, Dr. Letty has, uh, has been a leader in that field, and as well uh, to help regulate return to the classroom, which we're realizing is uh, as important. So brain trauma continues to be a leading injury in sports. So the state of the science is this, is that less than 50% of concussions or, uh, yeah, of concussions that present with symptoms, that actually present with symptoms, are not report, are reported. That will not change. We'd like to think more education will move that dial, but it's very unlikely. So this is going to be reality. Uh, most of the head impacts that occur in sport and other things are invisible. They remain invisible. They do not get reported. Uh, they don't have symptoms. They just happen and people just move on. Head trauma symptoms are broad. And the, we always talk about this list, but it changes uh, constantly as science changes. Brain injury, including concussion, continues 
to be hard to diagnose, and this will continue. The other thing is trying to um, predict or, or uh, uh, diagnose severity. It is really tough, and I think if anything, the scientists that have presented and the clinicians that have presented in this conference would agree that trying to figure out who's going to we still have symptoms two weeks out, a week out, a month out, a year, or a lifetime is very hard to determine. There, we're getting better at it, there's no question, but it's very hard to determine. Uh, when you, we work and we analyze, I shouldn't say we, when the, t the people in our lab uh, analyze videos, uh, when we have to analyze videos of five, six, seven-year-olds playing sport, um, it is boring because <laughs> they're out there running around, some of them kind of involved in play, most of them not, and nobody's getting hit in the head. So <laughs> the poor students are watching video after video after video, nothing happens. Uh, so kids really, to be fair, are um, not uh, trying to run around and hit each other in the head. We actually coach them to do that. We train them to do that. And we notice that as they get older, uh, that the amount of head trauma increases with age, increases with the competition level. Uh, so we are part of the problem, there's no question. And it's really unique by the sport, of course, and by gender or sex. The other thing that we have to start paying attention to is that special populations who are groups or individuals who are at higher risk of severity and complications from concussions and head trauma. And that's just beginning to uh, be investigated. So this brings me to the second part of the presentation, and that is artificial intelligence to improve brain trauma management in youth sport. So that's really uh, I, what I want to talk about today and where we believe the future of uh, managing uh, sport head, or head injuries, specifically in sport, but in other areas as well, uh, is going to go. So really we identify three things because we believe uh, one of the big challenges with head trauma is make it visible so that you know when the head's being traumatized, because when you know it's being traumatized, you can manage it. If you don't know it's being traumatized, well, nothing happens, and, I, and that's typically what's happening today, is for the most part, unless somebody starts having symptoms, you're kind of going, well, it's good to go. Um, so we need a means to be able to identify high energy impacts to the head, because most of the games that are played in youth sport, and this is where your work is, uh, you don't have spotters. You can't afford people to be sitting up there in the uh, top row looking down trying to identify events happening. It's usually an overworked athletic therapist at the side of the field trying to do everything that they can and, they're, and at the same time they're supposed to be watching to see if somebody has taken a high energy impact and is at risk for either concussion or trauma. They need information to act on. The other thing is measurement to create a brain trauma profile. So if the athletes are being traumatized and the high frequency uh, and the interval between that frequency starts to, and the magnitude starts to go up, I'm quoting uh, uh, Dr. Carton's research in case you're running, wondering and uh, thinks he's not really pleased the way I quote it, but essentially it's a frequency, it's a magnitude interval and duration event. So that really creates risk for uh, head uh, neurodegenerative disease and complications in uh, neurodegenerative disease. So we need a way of measuring that. We actually do not have that in any real way. And pro sports doesn't have it either, actually. We need a documentation, a way to document it so this information be, um, becomes available to the medical field, to the uh, coaches, to the parents, to the athletes. So essentially, this is what I'm talking about, a trauma, a brain trauma management system, and that this information uh, is gathered, 
collected automatically and is made available first to the parents, the sideline staff, so that if an athlete on the field or two athletes or whatever have an event where they have a high energy event, it, within seconds it goes to the bench, they immediately know it, the uh, trainer or the coach or athletic trainer at, si at the side, sorry, athletic therapist at the sidelines can immediately act upon it they can use it. And this, we think, is really important. So, you know, after that, you've heard very eloquently that there are st steps that are taking depending on what has happened. Uh, but first, you have to know what happened. And we've got 20 kids on, or 22 kids on the field. It's very hard to figure, sorry, 24 players on the field. It's very hard to be able to monitor all these players all the time. And as, as well, this information then will guide organizations in terms of how to manage brain trauma and how to change rules, change all these different things, gameplay. And while a lot of organizations uh, like the NCAA, uh, NFL, have really started to modify their rules based on the data we've collected, this would provide the same information for the athletes at the youth level. Because they're different. They play the game differently. They have different risks. So mimicking what the pros are doing is not a good strategy. So why big data? Well, one thing big data gives us is we can personalize it. So every athlete would have their own personal management system. And that's useful, that's very important, because every athlete will have different criteria in terms of how you're going to manage head trauma. And Parents and the athlete may have different objectives in life. They know they're not going to go to the NHL. They know that they're not going to the NFL. What they're going to go to is perhaps Harvard or University of Ottawa. I put them on equal line. <laughs> the other thing it does, it allows us to develop programs that are age specific, gender specific, competition level specific, sport specific, and athlete specific so that we can develop prevention, prevention strategies, diagnosis tools, and treatment plans for that individual. And this communication that Dr. Konyawaye talked about could be, would be automatic, just goes up into the system and is delivered to the individuals. So we have kind of started this in our field. So we had helmet sensors. Unfortunately, the helmet sensors are not particularly precise enough, and they're expensive. So, you know, it's hard enough to pay for kids in youth sport. Uh, adding another $100 to it becomes very challenging. Same with mouth guards. Um, they're very expensive. Uh, they're hard to manage. Um, and same with us. We do, th on the right-hand side, we do video reconstruction. Extraordinarily time-consuming, very complex, requires expertise. So these things really can't provide that, uh, that data or that information. This is where big data can do that. In being able to collect big data, uh, we will be able to identify uh, the characteristics for all these different groups. Because that's one thing that big data does. It won't tell us what's happening, but it can help us understand the relationships between trauma and these groups. So what we really are interested in is developing computer and vision technology. And you know the really advantage we have today is that this is really a, a, a burgeoning area of technology, primarily driven by betting. So when you go on to the NHL or NFL and you watch games and you can bet on one player or one player and all that, that's because these groups have already developed the vision technology to pull information off and be able to feed these betting groups as to what the options are, what the percentages are, the analytics. So thank you very much for all of you who bet on sports because it's helped driven that technology development. So one of the, the other things that's really advantage to us is sports are videotaped almost everywhere all the time. And some of us don't even know that. When you old guys go and play hockey at the local rink, you're being videotaped and it's going up on the, uh, uh, the internet and uh, your uh, husband or wife can see you playing. Not a good thing always, but they can see you playing. One of the problems we have uh, in video analysis is it takes a greater than 15 hours to do one event. And that's problematic for us. When we bring it into the lab, uh, all that data you've seen over the years, I've suffered hours and hours of analysis. Um, 
and <laughs> I can't say that with a straight face, but the students have suffered hours and hours. <laughs> uh, uh, analyzing the data. And so when we have one event, 16 hours to really uh, do the modeling and do all the complex things that are involved. Um, so what our goal is using automated systems is to drop it to 10 seconds. So it will video, during a videotape, it'll analyze events. Those events will automatically, within 10 seconds, go to the side of the, uh, the field or the ice. And so the, uh, the medical official or the coaches or the parents are immediately, they know something has happened and they need to take action. So what's involved? Player definition, and just video analysis, player definition, just to show you how complicated this is, and to be quite honest, when I started on this, I had no clue. Uh, it took a year or two just to educate me as to what the steps were. Uh, player definition and tracking, a multiplayer identification and tracking, head impact event detection to establish frequency, frame calibration, so we know how hard the person is getting hit, and head impact characteristics, uh, things like impact velocity, uh, impact type, because that determines compliance and duration, uh, and impact location. These all affect the magnitude of the impact. So we can predict, we need this so we can predict how severe the event is. So in this, really what we're doing is collecting this information using video tracking and video capture or data capture from video. And then we use an AI, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, and develop algorithms that give us the magnitude and event type. We need this information so that we can then improve the events. The other thing we collect is the, of course, the event frequency, so frequency and magnitude, and the athlete background the information that goes in about the athlete and so that these characteristics that influence how they're going to be at risk is already in their program. So that comes in and create, using big data, we can create the algorithms that will provide accurate information and valuable information to the people involved. So here's a little example of uh, af uh, tracking an athlete. And you can see these stick men look a bit funny, but it's really important that we can do this and be able to do it. I, can you do it again one more time there? Oh, I see. I just go back. Okay. So you can see that even though it looks odd, it really gives us a lot of information. Okay. So what the next step was is to then start multiplayer tracking, and that is track everybody on the ice all the time because you can't just track one player. And so it looks something like this. So what you can see, even a guy standing in the, in the you'll see in the stands, we pick him up too. I don't think he's gonna get a concussion, but uh, <laughs> the program picks up everybody and this monitors every player on the ice. So we're developing programs here and then an event program. So we can see when an event occurs. And so this gives you a little example, and I'll, I, I've tried before to try and stop this unsuccessfully, so I'll let it run and I'll just talk over it and we'll run it at least twice. So here's when Crosby gets hit. Here's when we identify the helmet so that we know where the helmet is and when he gets hit, we'll know that. And here, we have to have identification of how and who's getting hit, because if you have multiple players, you gotta know who it is. So we use the number, and I think the number and the color, to get the uh, player identification. And then if you play it again, on the last version of that, you can see the inbound velocity, impact velocity, uh, location, and uh, shoulder, what the event was. And so this, that information really provides us enough information that we can then use artificial intelligence to build algorithms that then, then predict the, um, the severity of the impact. So I just wanted to show this because you can see how it's very, and you can see on the side there, impact type, shoulder, uh, seven meters per second, side of the head. And so when we do this, we've run this, basically we can establish frequency, uh, the magnitude by using impact velocity, impact type, which gives us duration and compliance, and the location on the head. These things really predict how severe the impact is. And then we add athlete information that really helps us bring the personalized piece 
to the event and how you manage risk. Uh, I uh, asked the, uh, our people who are involved in artificial intelligence to give me a couple of slides. I'll say right now, I have no idea what this is, <laughs> except it looks like a violin to me. And um, apparently, this is what you do when you identify uh, the different uh, methods that you use to ultimately predict, eff effectively or accurately predict uh, uh, your outcomes. I know what the outcome should be, um, but, uh, and so then she sent me all these, as if this makes more sense to me. <laughs> uh, I didn't, but apparently this, they run a variety of different ways to predict um, uh, the, the relationship between the data and in this case, severity, and then from this you identify which violin uh, is the most effective. <laughs> so that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> um, so levels of uh, brain severity, we need to know what level identifies critical, what we call critical level, and this is a risk for a severe brain injury. We want to be able to say this, uh, an event has happened on the field or on the ice, that it is severe, stop stop play, make sure this person is looked after. Second piece is a concussion risk. So we want to know the severity because we say, listen, this person falls within uh, a risk for a concussion. They need to be looked after. So this information has to go to the medical staff, has to go to the, uh, the coaches, etc., to make sure the athlete comes off the ice and then is treated appropriately. And then the other piece uh, level is the sub-concussive, what we call sub-concussive, but all impacts to the head. And that goes into what's called the brain trauma profile, and that brain trauma profile creates an understanding of the level of trauma that will be attributed to neurotraumatic, sorry, uh, chronic traumatic uh, encephalopathy or neurodegenerative disease. So these are the things that we want to be able to manage that artificial intelligence and these programs I'm describing today will help us do. And I'm going to reference this because this is uh, uh, Dr. Carton's paper in which we looked at, or she did, sorry, we looked at magnitude, frequency, interval, and duration, and used this as the real foundation to document um, neural trauma and its association with long-term disease. And so from this, what, is, what happens? What happens is that it informs the medical professionals, the parents and sideline staff, and the sport organizations. Because we feel, number one, uh, as I described, the people on the sideline need to know information that's very specific to what actions they're going to take and how they're going to manage the athlete. The medical professionals need this information because they need to know what happened. You know, when you get the, the, a physician off and a person with a concussion and their parent shows up, you know, they have a very poor understanding of what happened. And so now the, the physician's trying to figure out what in the world's going on here. They look at the patient. Do they know the history of the patient? Have they had multiple con concussions? Have they, um, do they have certain conditions that would put them at higher risk? This is all information that the medical professionals need to know if they're effectively going to treat or diagnose or, tr or uh, refer um, athletes to better uh, care. The sport organizations need to know this because they are held responsible for not just insurance, but also how they manage the game. So knowing that the game is being played safely is extraordinarily important. And the sport organizations are responsible for knowing that. And they kind of go by looking at the refereeing reports and things like this. This will provide them really objective information that they can use to guide and understand uh, their sport and make changes to their sport. We want to put this in the hands of the professionals. It's not us. It is the coaches, it's the sport, it's the people who know the most about the sport. And people like yourself not only know the sport, you know the athletes. Yeah, I just talk, talked about this, so I don't need to bore you through it again. So in summary, we want to improve surveillance on the field in real time. We want to support improved diagnosis and treatment. Identify injury risk factors for individual athletes associated with head impacts. 
and implement, implement and evaluate intervention strategies to manage head trauma and sport. We are not going to do those strategies. We're going to provide the information that lets the professionals like Dr. Cornway manage it more effectively. Big data provides us the ability to do that. We can capture huge amounts of data. Uh, one of the big advantages we have is everything's being videotaped. Our goal is for a parent or to a coach or a medical professional, have one person hold up their iPhone and take that information and use that to do this. So it won't be limited to really complex ways of collecting data. We think that AI and machine learning will be able to do this. We've already run some tests on data sets that our lab has, and it's very promising results. We're starting to see that this is starting to connect for us. Of course, as the data starts to grow, we can start doing more, uh, be more accurate and more effective predictions. We really think personalized prevention, diagnosis, treatment is important. We can't treat everybody the same. And fortunately, right now, we have clinicians doing that job. As, as Jenny demonstrated, when they come in, you've got to spend time with your athletes, spend time with the person to get to know them. We think that a lot of this information can be provided ahead of time. And we want a user interface to be the smartphone, because everybody has a smartphone, apparently. So my kids tell me. So in order to do this, we put together a scientific team, um, obviously, uh, groups that are very technically driven, people that understand artificial experts in artificial intelligence, and some of the uh, videos you saw where we can map the movements of the athletes, Dr. Graham, and then Dr. Carton, who uh, his PhD is really on understanding brain trauma related to neurodegenerative disease, and then we have uh, Dr. Ross, who also expertise is in terms of uh, artificial intelligence in sport. Uh, I'd like to say, and as, as uh, Warren knows, probably next year when we present or if we do, uh, I'll take full credit for all of this, just to let you know, uh, without any shame whatsoever. So the goal is to have an automated data collection, data capture. Uh, this involves agreements with sport organizations, uh, a system that's secure so that uh, people feel that their information is not being shared, where it shouldn't be shared, uh, establishing uh, databases in the cloud, uh, data analysis, machine learning, and algorithms that continue to improve and, uh, uh, the algorithms, and so, of course, communication strategies. Sounds really simple, but, and again, this is the goal. I don't need to go through this again. And so, taking in what we really see this is in some cases the, you'll want to monitor the team, coaches and medical staff. Um, you want to model, uh, monitor the individual, provide information to the individuals. This will all go to different groups. And in some cases, you'll have a review of events. So we want it at every level. So you can look at, if it goes to a medical staff, a physician, you can, they'll pull up the event, be able to see it, and then we'll be able to provide information, trauma information regarding that event. So the goal is personalized, provide objective brain trauma information for managing injury risk by parents, athletes, medical staff, physician, leagues, and teams provide personalized brain management programs for athletes that account for things like age, trauma history, competitive level, sex, and medical history. Now, and one of the things, having collected data from kids from, I don't know, four or five years old, right up to professional athletes, we know they're very different. Not just the athletes, of course, but the game itself. So treating it as one game, play like a pro when you're eight years old, makes no sense whatsoever provides personalized objective brain trauma to help develop safer equipment specific to children, youth, and gender. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you everyone who's done the presentations that we've been seeing. Um, this is absolutely an amazing event to be able to come to. I think this is my fourth time here. And uh, I'm so very- So before you get started, I'd like to thank you on behalf of everybody because I'm gonna take, again, all the credit. Okay. <laughs> Please do. 
it's all right, because how I end this, you're going <laughs> to probably like how I do it. Um, <laughs> So I'm busy, very busy jotting down all the notes of everything I've done, and I have to admit, I truly understand now what a wise doctor wrote, because I looked at my notes last night, and it looks the same. Um, I'm a teacher, I am a first aid instructor, I teach throughout the whole board to all the educators to give them the information about concussions. As I said, I'm very, very busy scribbling here, and the information you give is absolutely amazing. So. Here's the you wish to take credit. I am going to sort of ask through you to ask your brother, to ask the organizers, to hopefully ask the presenters that would they be willing to give us their slideshow presentations in a PDF form so I can make sense of this, so I can present and give the information to others, because this is so, so valuable. Thank you. Mike? <laughs> I like the way you looked up going, me? So I, I, we've actually discussed that very question. So I, I, I don't know the answer, to be fair, because they wouldn't tell me. But, uh, <laughs> but they are um, looking at, I think, ways to make some of this available, I, I think. But it, it's not my, uh, it's, above my pay, it's above my pay grade, just to <laughs> let you know, with pretty near everything here is. Yeah, again, thank you. It's just been a, a wonderful presentation, uh, everything I've seen. Uh, I was just curious with the uh, work you were doing with the AI, um, just where mass comes into the equation. I, I know that you take into account the magnitude. Is that kind of where it, because I'm thinking it's, it's a different impact if I take a soccer ball to the head at eight meters per second versus another athlete's shoulder, you know, and, and the guy's 220 pounds or something like that. Yeah, uh, you bring up a very good um, point, and that is, because we deal with reconstructions of all sorts of impacts, including soccer balls, um, the event matters. And if you noticed on that, uh, uh, probably was embedded a bit, but we identify event. And that's really location where you get hit, with from the mask or side of the head, and the event, because it's very specific to where you get hit. So getting hit by a, a soccer ball or heading a soccer ball that's being kicked by the goalie halfway or maybe two-thirds down the field is a completely different event than uh, trying to just bounce a pass to somebody. Uh, same with uh, getting hit with a, uh, a, 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 through the mask. Surprisingly, the mask absorbs a lot of energy in hockey, for those of you, if you're talking about hockey, because it's quite flexible. Uh, and it's sitting, I think, about... Um, can't remember, I think it's a 50 millimeters or something off the nose or something off the, the face. Uh, so it's got a lot of room to absorb energy. Um, so usually if you get hit in the, in the mask, it's not a bad thing. Um, but yeah, everyone creates a different magnitude and that's why you have to have the information that we talked about in that video or else you're just wild ass guessing as to what's happening. Yeah. Hi there. Mm -hmm. Um, I see you're dealing a lot with technology. You, you talked about helmets and you brought up about mouth guards. What about neck protection? Um, the, my son does BMX, so we got him one of those collars, which was quite hard to find, but um, there seemed to be a lot of talk about brainstem being connected to the concussion. Uh, is that anything that you, your group is working on or is there information about effective uh, neck guards or neck protection that we could add into uh, as an extra protection for our athletes? If you're wondering why I'm looking around, if you're wondering why I'm looking around, I just want to make sure my son is not here. He's doing his PhD in biomechanics in neck. And so we argue a lot about why the neck, I go, neck, so what? And he's uh, about what? <laughs> I kind of think he might be here, but um, the, the, you, you have to the, the neck is really interesting for us. First of all, protecting the neck with a neck collar, other than when you have a Hans device and going to run into the wall at 220 miles an hour, um, has less effect in being impacts to the head because the head, it, the energy goes through the head within about 20 milliseconds. And so it's almost you don't see the head move before the energy goes through. So it has a limited effect. But on the other hand, uh, having uh, increased stiffness in the neck, that's what these protectors, I think you're referring to the, the bigger, are you referring to the blood flow control ones or the bigger protectors? Uh, it, it absorbs impact when the helmet hits. It absorbs ah, yeah, the impact the bigger into ones the neck, that, the collar, it's like goes all yeah. the way down the chest. And yeah. Then, yeah. yeah, yeah. Those have had a very limited um, uh, effect 
just because, as I said, the, the head doesn't move a lot, almost imperceivably, before the energy actually goes through the brain. And so that, they're limited. However, they do help you know, when you're preparing and you can kind of connect the system to, de to decrease the load. And it's the same with the increased um, stiffness of the neck in that in certain impacts, um, you are going to be able to absorb more energy if your neck is stiff. Uh, but that's a, a relatively narrow uh, range that it's effective. I mean, how many boxers that have been successful do you know stiffen the neck and take the punch in the face? Almost zero. And the reason is, is the way the energy transfers to the brain, and a lot of the transfer is rotational. That's really what creates a lot of uh, strain to the brain. And of course, uh, neck protectors don't have any benefit in terms of this business. And as anybody here who boxes, which I'm sure most of you do, uh, <laughs> know it's a hook that really knocks people out. You ought to hook them, hook them below the center of gravity, and down they go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hajizaki, for your presentation and for your immeasurable contribution to the ICS this year and every year. Give Warren a nudge and let him know we're moving into break now. He's, you can get him up. Um, we are going to move into break. Uh, just There's some refreshments just outside, coffee and light snacks just outside the ballroom. Please return to your seats. Uh, we've just, we have about a 16-minute break. Please come back around 11 o'clock for the Jennifer Botterill keynote. Uh, closure. Thank you.